Well, hello, everyone. It, it is brilliant to be here. Um, I've been really encouraged um, hanging out with uh, the team and being there this morning over in Langold and then here this evening. And um, I know that you've been doing a series on your values. And I have to say, I think it's a brilliant set of values that now church has. Um, I went onto the website and I just loved what I saw. Devoted disciples. I mean, that's a good one to start with, isn't it? Of like, you know, I feel so passionate that, that Jesus wants his church back. Jesus wants a church that is full of wholehearted, lifelong disciples. And I know for me, you know, as I've been leading a church now for nearly 30 years. And I, and I know one day I will look Jesus, you know, in his eyes and I'll have to give an account for what I've done with my life, what I've done with my years. And I want to know that what's been built is things of quality. And that is about discipleship. I want to say, Jesus, there's a church of deep disciples, people who have loved you and held on to you through all the, the ups and the downs of life. They have been fully devoted. They have been wholehearted that these are people who have completely given their lives to you, that Jesus, you are Lord of every area of our life. And so that's the kind of church we want to be part of, isn't it? Fully devoted disciples that are looking like Jesus, that we're reflecting who he is, that when we speak, we're speaking the words of Jesus, and therefore it's words of life, it's words of hope, it's words of courage. That's the kind of words we want to be speaking. When we're touching people with our practical care, that we're being the hands of Jesus, you know, that there's something in terms of meeting the highest felt need in somebody's life. Because what happens is when we meet felt needs, we then build a bridge, don't we? And we can actually share the reason for our faith. Um, so devoted disciples is a brilliant one. Scattered servants, I love that. That actually that this is about, you know, it's not about the hour on a Sunday. It's about the whole rest of our lives. The whole of our lives matter to God matter deeply to God. And so as scattered servants, it means that for, for, for knowing that we're sent by the risen Christ to be servants wherever it is he's placed us, to be fully alive. I love that one. Um, I, th I think it was Irenaeus. I'm not sure. Some big legend of the faith said, the glory of God is man fully alive. You know, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive because what the world needs is people who are fully alive. People who are on fire. People who are operating in their passions. I would encourage you, if you are not able to articulate what your God-given passion is, then ask God. Say, God, would you break my heart for what breaks yours? Because when we're operating out of passion, that's when things happen, when we're fully alive. Courageous givers, that's absolutely brilliant. You know, I think there's something, isn't there, about, well, at the end of the day, you know, we can't take anything with us. <laughs> you know, when, the, when life is over, it all goes back in the box. We can't take our homes, our cars, our possessions, our stuff. And so there's something about what does it look like to be courageous givers, to actually, to, to, to be people of legacy, that we are investing what God has given us into the kingdom because the kingdom is eternal. I want to be someone that builds my life with things of eternal value and to, you know, to, to, to invest. We cannot outgive God. So let's be courageous givers. And then forever family, church is family. I think church is, is really, it's, it's a community of the broken finding family together. You know that church is... It is this forever family. It's God's dream that church is a place where we belong. So I'm, um, I love the fact you've done the, the, this series on values, and I'm going to be speaking today on the kingdom of God that will in many ways tie all this together. You know, when Jesus was on the earth, we know he spoke about a lot of things. I mean, he spoke about money. He spoke about giving. He spoke about all these things. But the thing that Jesus spoke about the most was the kingdom of God. Just, you know, I, I haven't done all the sums, but I think if, it's something like, I think, in Matthew's gospel, he refers to the kingdom of God 119 times and to church twice. It's something on that level. Jesus is obsessed 
with the kingdom of God. And whenever you see Jesus, you know, he loves people. People are always crowding around him. And he's saying, this is the kingdom. This is the kingdom. When he's healing people, this is the kingdom of heaven at hand. When he's feeding people, this is the kingdom of heaven at hand. When he's raising people's dignity, like with the, with the woman caught in adultery. When it, it, it's like this is the kingdom of heaven at work on earth. You see Jesus and you see the kingdom of God embodied. He came to usher in the kingdom. He came to reverse the curse of the fall and create this community of kingdom people. The church is an audiovisual demonstration of the kingdom of heaven on earth. I love that description of church. I love the fact that we are this collective, this community of people. So when they touch us as a community, they see and they hear maybe even smell, I don't know, the aroma of Christ. They see something of the kingdom of heaven on earth. And we know, don't we, that the kingdom of God, at its simplest definition, is the rule and the reign of God. Wherever God is ruling and reigning, there's the kingdom. So when we're operating in the ways of the kingdom, we're advancing the kingdom, the places and the spaces where God is king. And we live, don't we, between this kind of the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. And in between, we're, we're kind of holding on to the now and the not yet of the kingdom, that Jesus brought in a measure of the kingdom and has commissioned us as the audiovisual demonstration of kingdom people to be advancing his kingdom. But we also know a day is coming. When Jesus Christ will return and the fullness of the kingdom of God is restored. There is a calendar day. There really is when Jesus Christ will return. Wouldn't it be amazing if that is in our lifetime? Wouldn't that be incredible? But we're in this in-between and it's our job to, to, to be grabbing kind of handfuls of the kingdom of heaven and dragging it into earth, into the here and into the now. He began a revolution. Not anything like the revolutions that we see of might or power, you know, or force. It's a revolution that's a topsy-turvy kingdom. A revolution that starts in the hearts. And it's all about laying down power, worldly power, and serving the least, the last, and the lost. The revolution starts small, but it never stops growing. You'll know some of the parables. Let me read to you a couple of parables. A parable is essentially a story with a bit of theology snuck in there. That's how Jesus does it. Matthew 13, verses 31 to 33, says this. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all the seeds Yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into flour until it worked all through the dough. It's about something starting small and then growing and growing and growing and and having more and more and more influence, like the mustard seed becoming a tree that the birds come and perch in. That speaks of safety and provision and protection. There's something that we're involved in. You know, the kingdom of God will never stop advancing. When Jesus died, there were probably a few hundred believers. There is now over 2.5 billion followers of Jesus. The kingdom of heaven will not stop growing. And that's what we're part of. And sometimes in our kind of context here in the Western world, it can, you know, we hear the stats about the church declining and different things. It's not, you know, we are part of the fastest growing movement on earth. It's just right now we're in, the, we're in a little bit of a, a blip, a bit of an anomaly in the Western world, um, you know, where at, at times it feels like the church isn't growing as, as it's designed to grow. But on a global scale... We are part of the fastest growing movement on the earth. So Jesus gave the Great Commission. It's never been revoked and it's not yet fulfilled. And so it's live. When he said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, that is our commission. And that's all part of growing and advancing the kingdom of God. And being a kingdom people means we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Our value system is different. 
We're about bringing the goodness and the peace and the joy, the life, the healing, the justice, the righteousness, the atmosphere of heaven to earth. Many of you will know this verse from Romans 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And, you know, when the kingdom of God is at hand, that's what you see. Whenever you see righteousness, it's the kingdom. Whenever you see peace ruling and reigning over the storms of life, we've sung about, you know, when life can sometimes feel hard, the faithfulness of Jesus. And I just think when followers of Jesus are able to be a non-anxious presence in the midst of a storm, that is showing the kingdom of heaven at hand. And I want to say to many, I want to commend many of you, those of you that have walked with Jesus for many years and many decades and you're still here, you're still faithfully holding on to Jesus and you've learned what it is for the peace of Christ to rule in your, in your hearts and in your minds, I want to commend you because that demonstrates the kingdom of heaven on earth. And so well done those of you who have really been through some storms in life. You know, some of the biggest storms, bereavement and, and health crises, and you've held on to the faithfulness of Jesus. That when you exhibit that sense of he is in control, he's on the throne, even though at times I don't understand what's going on, but I trust him. And I hold on to the peace that he's given me. That is evidence of the kingdom of God at hand. And so... We have a different value system. I, I've been struck even just thinking about the fruit of the Spirit, you know, the nine fruit of the Spirit. Obviously, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. They are all eternal qualities. So we cultivate them in our lives, and we cultivate them across our church communities. But you know that they are things that will last for eternity. That when we do finally get promoted and graduate to glory, that is going to be the atmosphere that we are then in for the rest of eternity. So these things are, are way more important than what we perhaps realize. The fruit of the Spirit. They are eternal attributes. They're going to last and a kingdom mindset means we see things differently. A kingdom mindset means we don't see things as they are. We see things as they could be. And that's a wonderful place to be. It's almost like God puts on a new pair of glasses. So that when you're looking up around your local community here, you don't just see things as they are. You don't just see where there's areas of perhaps brokenness or pain or need. You see things as they could be when the kingdom of heaven comes. You imagine a different story. And then what God says to you is, as you imagine the different story for your community, oh, perhaps you're going to be part then of writing that story. We lived opposite a church building for the first five years of our married life, myself and my husband. And it was a church building that, that had got closed down. And it was just kind of old and cold and derelict. And I can remember praying that the building would be, would, well, that, that the congregation, it was a kind of like a, a, an Anglican church, that somehow it would be restored, revived, and come back to life. And then God somehow then answered that prayer. And years later, we ended up actually buying that building and bringing it back to life. And, um, and, and yeah, something that really serves the community. So a kingdom mindset, we see, we see God's heart and vision and we get to tell a different story. So even as you're just walking about your locality, let me encourage you, don't just walk. Walk and pray. Walk and pray. Walk and say, Holy Spirit, would you right now capture my imagination with possibilities of what could be? You know, if there are places that are shut down, what does it look like for them to come back to life? Because that's what the kingdom does. The kingdom is all about bringing things back to life. The kingdom is about restoration. The kingdom is about making all things new. So as you walk, walk and pray. Say, Holy Spirit, give me eyes to see. What are you doing? A kingdom mindset means we can spot what is already of the kingdom in a place and celebrate that. Shine a light on that. Rejoice in that. 
So when you see things perhaps in your family, in your streets, in your neighborhood, in your workplaces that is of the kingdom, then, then, then shine a light. Say, yes, this is of the kingdom of God. And equally, when you see things that are not of the kingdom, there's a clash of kingdom values, then perhaps God might be asking you to do something about that. We've got a friend uh, who really felt as though there needs to be more of a celebration of arts and creativity, and so set up an art gallery uh, in, a, in, a, in a unit that was closed down, bringing life and colour back into uh, that shopping centre. Another friend who uh, was in a workplace and nobody spoke to each other. They just all sat at the same desks in front of the same computers day after day. And she just thought, this isn't of the kingdom of God. And so she created something she called Fun Fridays, which meant every Friday lunchtime, everyone had to down tools. And then they went and did something fun on a Friday lunchtime. And she ended up really creating a great sense of community in that workplace and ended up getting an award for it. So we know, don't we, that all around us, we have got this mix of being a messed up and a blessed up world. We've got this mix of beauty and brokenness. It's basically original sin and original glory all mixed in together. It's the weeds and the weeds. It's like a cracked mirror. You see something still of the image of God in the people around you and the situations, but you also see something of the brokenness. And kingdom people know that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, Psalm 24, verse 1. So that means that we train our eyes to see where the goodness and the glory of God is. And we celebrate that. We express a lifestyle of gratitude and worship. G.K. Chesterton said this, The worst moment for an atheist is when he is really thankful and has got no one to thank. I thought that's brilliant. I know the, start, the story of my dad becoming a Christian was actually when I was born. <laughs> and, um, and he held me and thought, There's, I feel an overwhelming sense of gratitude and I don't know who to thank. <laughs> So there's something, isn't there, of when there's something of like incredible beauty or gratitude that, that as the people of God we know who to thank and we can help others point their gratitude towards God. Again, G.K. Chesterton said this, when it comes to life, the critical thing is whether you take things for granted or take things with gratitude. And he said this, I mean, this is obviously back in the day. He said, you say grace before meals, okay, but I say grace before the concert and grace before the play and grace before the pantomime and grace before I open a book and grace before sketching and grace before swimming and grace before boxing and walking and playing and dancing and grace before I dip this pen in the ink. That was a man who had cultivated gratitude. And there's something, of, it's a, again, there's something that overflows in us when we have that kingdom mindset because we can see the goodness of God in all the things that he has put around us. So kingdom people see that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it and are so grateful for that. And kingdom people know that the whole of their lives matter to God. There's no sacred, secular divide. The whole of life is actually spiritual. It's the only secular thing is sin. That's why we stay away from it. It's that that dehumanizes us. There's no hierarchy of jobs. We're all sent ones. We're all called to be agents of the kingdom of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, bearers of the divine image, with all the power of heaven invested into us. So again, when you leave your front door of a morning, whether it's to go to the shops to get the paper, whether it's to go do grandparenting duty, whether it's to go to the workplace, see yourself as a sent one. Someone sent by God, filled with the Holy Spirit. And you know, ask God, who are the God appointments that you're setting me up with today? Because there will be some if you're looking out for them. There are people all around us whose lives are desperate for a touch of the kingdom of heaven. Just desperate for somebody to just listen to them, to offer to pray with them, to tell them that God is real and he loves them. So to go out of your front door every morning and say, God, where are the God appointments? Who are you sending me to? And he always answered that prayer, always answers that prayer. 
And so we're all called to be full-time ministers. I uh, told the story of this morning where uh, one Sunday I got a whole load of people lined up who all did different things in their daytime, in their front line. You know, one was a full-time mom, one worked in a shop, one was a teacher, one was an accountant. And I had some badges made that said full-time minister. And I put the badge on all of them. And I said, you are all full-time ministers. We all are. There's no hierarchy of jobs or hierarchy of calling if we go in the power of God. If we go knowing that we're a sent one. If we go knowing that we carry the kingdom of God with us. So what might that look like for you? 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, So whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. My husband has actually got that written. He's got a man cave, which is like our basement that we sort of damp-proofed and turned into his office. And on the way down the stairs, he's got that verse like written, painted in huge letters. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Whatever we do, whether we are doing an email, making a phone call. Brother Lawrence talked about practicing the presence of God. When we're washing up, we can be mindful of the goodness of God. That's the kind of people we're called to be. There's something about being sent ones. I, um, <laughs> when, when COVID started, I, I felt God say to me, be a secret pastor of a secret congregation. Because obviously it was kind of hard to, to be a church leader in quite the same way as, um, you know, as I'd been used to doing. And I just was really struck by the fact that there was a whole load of people in the surrounding streets of our house, who were really, really scared. And what would it look like to be a secret pastor to that secret congregation? And so on the very first Sunday, many of you will remember, was Mother's Day. And so I bought 40 bunches of daffodils. And one of my daughters made 40 homemade thank you cards. And I didn't know all the people that lived in those homes. But I put a bunch of daffodils, 40, of the houses on either side and across the road with a homemade thank you card, just saying thank you and left my number and said, um, wouldn't it be great to form a WhatsApp group of our local neighborhood so we can help each other? And I got the most moving messages back, one from a man literally three doors down, and I didn't know that his wife had recently died. And he messaged me saying, um, thank you so much for the daffodils and for the, the Mother's Day card. Um, it actually meant a lot to me because I've recently lost my wife. But the fact that there was something of acknowledgement that I'm here, something of an acknowledgement of a, of, a, of a thank you for the way I have tried to be a good parent, and just, and just the fact that someone's reached out. And so we created this WhatsApp group, and then we did all kinds of things. And, and I was trying to think, what would a secret pastor do with this secret congregation? So the first thing we did was a, um, um, we called it Toot Hills Got Talent. And it was basically like a talent show, but on WhatsApp. <laughs> and so I got everyone to do their kind of like, either sing a song or do some party tricks or, uh, you know, some person doing DIY and filmed it. Another person, their dog was doing tricks. They filmed that. Um, someone else sang. And we, we had this kind of, you know, just very funny. Um, but people were encouraging each other and they were getting to know each other. And then we did a Toot Hill, a Great British Bake Off, and people kind of made cakes and, um, and you know, delivered sort of cupcakes outside of everyone's door for judging. Um, and then one of the things we did, oh, has that gone off? Oh, no. One of the things we did was, again, bringing colour back into the community. We, we made hanging baskets for everyone and put them outside. And then what was really lovely was the, the man... Well, the husband and wife who ran our corner shop went over and above the call of duty in that season. Just incredible. Like, didn't shut up shop when, when he should have done. Found out he was clinically vulnerable, was delivering, you know, basic essentials. In fact, this man, because he didn't want to compromise either the health of his family or the health of the local community, he then stayed. There was a little flat above the shop. He stayed there and didn't actually see his wife and kids for a number of weeks in those really early stages, you know, when everyone was scared and we didn't know how contagious the whole thing was just in order to be able to serve the local community well and not compromise anyone's health. And, um, and I knew that people were deeply grateful for him. So I suggested, I made another WhatsApp group without him on it, suggested why don't we find a way to thank him 
to thank this legend in our community. So I created a, a huge thank you card with blank pages and invited all the neighbours to write little personal notes of appreciation. So they did that and put that through my door and then I, I put them all together into a big, big thank you card. And then I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to bless him and his family with some money to treat themselves when lockdown ended because they'd made such a big sacrifice of not having family time. So I thought we maybe might raise £100, you know, but money kept on coming through my door until 500 pounds had come through my door. And so what we basically arranged this whole, this whole kind of uh, thing where on a prearranged day, after one of the last NHS claps, we all stayed out. He didn't know this was going to happen. We all stayed out on the streets. There were about 80 of us, some people with saucepans banging, people clapping, people cheering. And I presented him with this gigantic card and 500 pounds, and while everyone around was going, Woo! and cheering him, and it was so moving, and he was in tears, and it was, to me, that felt like this is the kingdom. This is the kingdom of heaven on earth, right here, right now, because, because there's, there's appreciation, there's community. You know, this, this is something of the atmosphere of heaven on earth. So, how can we bring about a little bit more kingdom redemption? Um, I've just got a couple of videos, if that's okay, to, to show. One is of a, um, a wonderful church down in Eastbourne. And what I love about how they bring the kingdom of God is so holistic. It's so whole of life. They've basically got seven allotments that are all next to each other. And they, they look after the land, they grow fruit and veg, they give away, they have a community lunch. They actually have an expression of church in a polytunnel on a Sunday um, because, because, because they just feel like this is where God has called us. And so we, we are bringing something of God's kingdom here to earth. And then the other, if we can then play the branch video, um, that's just a brilliant example again of a church reaching out in all kinds of ways to bring the kingdom of God to earth. So have a look at these two videos. I guess I, guess I see that the kingdom of God is about all of life and not just kind of church meetings on a Sunday. I also feel quite strongly about the table and gathering around the table. There's just something that happens when we, you know, eat together. About six years ago, I was working as a chaplain in a, another community centre. As part of my job, we were doing a Friday lunch. A friend introduced me to Paul because we wanted to cook good, nutritious food. And uh, she said, oh, you know, she had a friend who had this big allotment. For a year or so, I used to come on a Wednesday and work, take the produce home, and we'd cook it for the Friday. And then when I left that job, we decided that we'd like to do what we were doing on the Friday before here. It kind of grew because we got more volunteers. So now we're up to 50 to 60 volunteers. During the summer, we did a 10 week garden club for, for the kids. And one of the things they did was they planted seeds to grow pumpkins and squashes. Tonight we're having this light party so they can collect their pumpkin. We've got a recipe for, for them to take home so they can actually use it rather than it being wasted. I'm actually loving Sunday mornings at the moment. I'm loving having the volunteers who actually requested, could we do something like this? Even though, you know, they know that there's a, going to be an element of faith. And I just get so excited each Sunday that I know that they're going to come down and we meet under the gazebos. We felt that God spoke to us about each gazebo being hope and healing. I think my hopes are that people really get the connection between the land and following Jesus. Knowing Jesus isn't just about going into a building. Actually, we can take church to where people are. The branch is about transformation through love and belonging. So it's about changing people's lives. Paddock, where the branch is based, is quite a place of poverty. It wasn't that long ago we started branch, but we've always been doing community stuff as soon as we got here. Just love doing it. We started Melody Makers. From Melody Makers, we then started other groups. People cross between different groups that so everybody becomes part of a community. 
So the Food Check came out of the pandemic because we were a food bank for a while. We gathered so much food in the building because the church wasn't meeting there. So we got our heads together and thought, how can we do this so we're not producing the same as a food bank in town? And at the time we had a lot of families coming to us and saying, well, the food bank only has tins of things and was mainly geared up for single men on the streets. Whereas the families wanted fresh fruit and vegetables and things that they could choose. So we decided we'd lay it out like a shop, they could come to it and it would be food that's going to landfill. So we have about 80, 80 people come in for bags at the minute. We have had members of the public turn up on the doorstep crying and saying, I can't believe I'm coming for a bag of food. But we say, no, it's fine, you're, you're helping the environment, you're doing good, it's okay. And they kind of get over it. I always had a prayer when I got here that I want to have such a excellence in what we do that the council will come and ask us for support and help and they will ask us how we do things and I'm amazed and I shouldn't be amazed if I prayed but that's actually happening the council are asking us to do things we've been invited on so many discussions the branch is part of a tree where you just bear fruit in the Holy Spirit for those around you I always thought the fruit was for the church but it's not the fruit is for our neighborhoods the fruit is for those around us So this is what we're called to, church, to bring the fullness and the goodness of the kingdom of God to all aspects of life. So um, I think it'd be good if we just had a, a very brief time, maybe turn in twos and threes, and just have a little think. Where is it that God has placed you to bring more of his kingdom here on earth? Where can you celebrate where the kingdom is already obviously at work? And where maybe is there a clash that you maybe need to do something about come in the opposite spirit. So just maybe a few minutes just to talk with each other. What's that, what's that left you thinking? Where has God placed you and what can you do about that? Thank you so much for watching The Preach. It has been an amazing morning and we would love to see you in the week at any of our events. So stay up to date on our social media, on our website. Keep checking because we update things all the time. We have so much going on and we'd love to see you there. Have a great week.